everyone. Uh, we are now into the next section on the CDF and expected values for continuous random variables. So, for the CDF of a continuous random variable, we have the following. We're computing the probability. Oh, why is it red? Uh, we are computing the probability that our random variable x is less than or equal to some number which I'm denoting by a little x. This is the definition of the CDF. And then we ask ourselves, how is it that we compute that? Well, probabilities for continuous random variables are integrals. So this is going to be the integral from, well, let's see, what's the lower end point? That's going to be negative infinity. So we go from negative infinity up to x. And we are integrating the PDF, which is f. Uh, We'll integrate this with respect to t. Okay, so thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus, we have the following relationship between the PDF and the CDF of a random variable, which is that uh, the CDF, no, the PDF of a random variable is equal to the derivative with respect to x of the CDF of that random variable, which you could possibly relate this back to that formula that we saw for going from the CDF to the PDF uh, to the probability mass function of a discrete random variable. And if you look very closely at that formula, this is essentially what it's doing. Remember what different remember what differentiation is doing. Differentiation is finding a rate of change or um, uh, kind of this uh, incremental uh, difference in uh, the uh, in, in some quantity and if we look back at the formula for finding the probability mass function from the probably from the CDF in the discrete case what we essentially had was looking for the rate of change of the uh, CDF so we're now of course in that case the change only happened at jump points so what we were doing was checking how much a uh, how much the CDF was changing at jump points, basically. And that's what's going on here. So the two ideas are essentially connected. We had some uh, discrete analog of differentiation when we were looking at uh, the uh, discrete case. Okay, so we can use now rules for the CDF to compute the probability of a continuous random variable taking values in an interval. And uh, these resemble very this is basically the same rule that we had in the discrete case we have the probability that a is less than or equal to x which is less than or equal to b uh, that's going to be f of b minus f of a minus but actually because this is a continuous random variable there there is no a minus it's just a because this thing is continuous at a so we don't have to worry about um, like um, a left-hand limit of some sort because the left-hand limit is equal to the right-hand limit, which means also that this probability is going to be equal to the probability that A is less than X, which is less than or equal to B, or the probability that uh, A is less than or equal to X, which is less than B, or there's no inequalities at all, or there's no allowance of equality. Uh, that's also a possibility. Basically, we do not care about less than or less than or equal to. We are allowed to substitute those. Uh, so let's see. Uh, maybe I could write that a little better uh, and say and say that either one of these can be replaced. Uh, replaced by strict inequality. So we're allowed to do that, and we don't care about the boundaries of the region at all when we're working with continuous random variables. Okay, so let's move on to an example. Let's compute the CDF of a uniform random variable with a minimum A and maximum B and plot it. Okay, so the CDF, oops, I don't want red. The CDF at X is going to be the probability that x is less than or equal to little x, 
which is equal to, well, let's see. Uh, we can come up with two simplifying cases. One is that x is less than, if x, that x is less than a. So uh, if x is less than a, and you may notice that uh, what I'm doing is recall what the PDF of uh, the uniform was. It was um, uh, 1 over b minus a, oops, b minus a if a is less than x, no, a less than t less than b, and 0 otherwise. What we're doing is we're checking at the boundaries of the PDF because the PDF is a jump function. So we're looking at where jumps in the jump function happen. That produces, uh, that allows us to go to this uh, new, well, basically piecewise function. So uh, in, in this case, uh, we have that if X is less than A, then that means that the CDF, no, the PDF is going to be zero for everything for at X and to the left. So we're just going to be integrating zero everywhere. So that means that the CDF is going to be zero here. Uh, let's suppose also X is greater than uh, B. Okay, X is greater than B. Then that means that uh, if we were to look at the PDF, uh, we've got some point up here uh, and, we're in a, and we're taking the area underneath the curve and to the left of our point B. No, not e, not B, this is not B, this is X. Uh, this is X and uh, uh, this is B, okay? So we're taking the area underneath the curve and to the left of X, and that's gonna be just the area underneath that block, which is one. So that means that we're going to get one if X is greater than B. And both of these two boundaries should make sense because this random variable should be between a and b with probability one. So the probability that it's less than a should be zero, and the probability that it's less that it's uh, right, so so that means that if you ask for the probability of being less than a number less than a, you should get zero. And for any number greater than b, the probability that it's less than than that number is going to be one since it's going to be less than b, which is less than the input to the CDF. So it's going to be one on the right-hand side because this number is always be going to be between A and B. So these two boundaries should make in some intuitive sense. Uh, like I've gone some, I've I've worked harder in some sense than I needed to in explaining it. Uh, all right, so that leaves us the situation where uh, A is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to B. So let's go ahead and draw a picture. Here's A, here's B, here's some point X that we picked. All right. So we want the area underneath the curve and to the left of X. So that's gonna be this area here. The width of this region is going to be X minus A. And remember that the height of the rectangle is going to be one over B minus A. Uh, but we could also argue with, so that should already tell you what the answer is. Uh, it's going to be x minus a over b minus a. But we could also argue via calculus that this is going to be the integral from a to x, 1 over b minus a, uh, dt. And that this is equal to um, x minus a over b minus a uh, if... Uh, a is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to b. And we have 0 if uh, x is less than a. And we have 1 if uh, x is greater than b. And let's plot this uh, CDF. So if we were to plot this CDF, we have a here, we have b here. Uh, here's 1, here's 0. Uh, we'll plot this using a blue line. Uh, so at from B onward, uh, this thing is going to be 1. And from A and to the left, it's going to be 0. All right. And then we have, what, what do we have in between? Well, what we have is 
actually something linear. Uh, we have a linear, we, well, it's a line. It's a straight line uh, with a slope and an intercept. So what is, so if it's a straight line, it's going to connect to points where those two points they connect. Well, if we plug in A, we would get A minus A over B minus A in that middle part. So it would be zero. So that means that at the point A, this function is going to be zero. And at the point B, we would have B minus A over B minus A. So that would be one, which means that this line is connecting the points zero at zero and one between A and B. Okay, so this is the resulting function. And, well, I mean, I, I guess that's it. Uh, we're, we're done with that. But I want you to notice something about the CDF here. In the discrete case, the CDF had a t would jump. It was a jump function. Uh, it was piecewise. Well, okay, this is a piecewise function too. But it was constant everywhere except at the points where it would just jump up. This function has no jumps. In fact, uh, it's, uh, it, it's continuous everywhere. Like at these points, even though it's got uh, a quarter, it's still continuous, right? So because the left-hand limit is equal to the, or I guess that's the, that was the right-hand limit. The right, the right-hand limit is equal to the left-hand limit at all points. So it's a continuous function. And this is basically one way we could possibly say what the difference is between a discrete and continuous random variable. A discrete random variable has a CDF that is essentially a jump function and flat everywhere else. Right? So if the fu so the function either doesn't increase or it jumps. It does one of those two things. And that characterizes completely a discrete random variable. That's a way we could even define a discrete random variable. For a continuous random variable, we could say that a continuous random variable is any random variable where its CDF is continuous everywhere. And this would be one such example. And we can basically say that because if we were looking at, like, we can have random variables where they are neither discrete nor continuous, but in a way, a mixture of the two. We could have a random variable, or let's say this is one and this is zero. Uh, this would be a random variable where maybe at some regions, it's CDF is continuous, but at other points, it jumps up. And jumps correspond to points that have a positive probability of being selected. So that number, the probability that the random variable equals that number is not zero, but greater than zero. Um, but there are also other points where uh, it's uh, continuous. So the probability that it's equal to that particular number is zero, but it's possible that the probability that it's within a region uh, around that number is not zero. So, um, so, yeah, you can have, in fact, a mixture of discrete and continuous random variables. And such mixtures of discrete and continuous random variables, like, it's not only plausible, but it is, in fact, realistic. For instance, if we were to be talking about, say, the time that you're waiting to get serviced at a line, you could say, well, it's possible that you do have to wait, in which case... Uh, you're going to spend some continuous amount of time or some real some real valued amount of time and the probability that you spend any particular amount of, se of seconds is zero or it's possible that you don't have to wait at all and you're serviced immediately, in which case the wait time is zero. So that would mean that the probability of being zero is a non-zero number, but the probability of being anything else is zero. So we do have random variables that are neither discrete nor continuous and... Um, and, uh, in fact, it is reasonable con to consider such random variables in practical application. We will not be discussing such random variables in this class. Okay, uh, next example. Compute the CDF of an exponential random variable with mean parameter mu and plot it. Okay, so as a reminder, the... Uh, I'm still in red. The... Uh, uh, CDF for such a, no, the PDF for such a random variable, my apologies, is going to be 1 over mu e negative x over mu if uh, x is greater than or equal to 0. 
Oh, and here's another thing. Uh, the boundaries of the of the uh, of these uh, jump functions or of these piecewise functions they actually don't matter. Like if I wanted to, I could replace greater than or equal to zero with greater than zero. Like I'm allowed to do that, and actually, I won't change my CDF. And the PDF will be as like the PDF is different, really, but not by much. I could do the same thing here. For like, for example, I have a less than t less than b, but if I wanted to, I could say a less than or equal to t less than or equal to b or any combination thereof, and it's the same thing. It's the same function. In fact, I could change the value of the PDF at any countable number of points. Maybe just for for pure lulls, just put a hole right here and say that it jumps down to here, and it wouldn't matter because the integrals still end up being the same. And the distribution of this random variable is characterized by integrals. It is characterized by these things. And since those are what are actually characterizing the the distribution of the random variable, I can do whatever I want to the PDF in a way. Well, not whatever I want, but so long as what, whatever changes I make to the PDF don't actually change how integrals end up being calculated, I can make that change. So in fact, uh, PDFs do not uniquely identify random variables because the PDFs may not be unique for that, ran for that random variable, since I can redefine them and still have essentially the same random variable. But CDFs do uniquely identify a random variable. If you know the CDF, you know the random variable. And for the most part, even though we're allowed to make small changes to the PDFs, they they're they're still essentially uh, characterizing a random variable. It's just there is that little that little wrinkle that you can make changes to PDFs, and so long as they don't change integrals, then you're fine. Uh, it's still basically the random the same random variable. All right, uh, continuing on with all of this, I just had to make that make that remark. Um, okay, so um, so here's the, here is a CD, uh, a PDF for an exponential random variable. We now want to compute the CDF. Uh, presumably, if x is less than zero, then the PDF is zero. So uh, we can say that there are two cases if x is less than zero and if x is uh, greater than or equal to zero. Oh, my apologies. There, I wrote f of t, but I wrote x here. So let's change this to t. Okay, that's better. All right. So, uh, if x is less than zero, then we're asking for the probability that this random variable is less than some number that's less than zero. But since this random variable is uh, positive almost surely, then the probability that this happens is zero. So that means that the CDF will be zero on this region. Alternatively, if x is greater than or, greater than or equal to zero, we're basically asking for the probability that zero is less than or equal to uh, x, which is less than or equal to little x. And that's going to be the integral from 0 to little x of f of t dt, where f of t is given here. OK, so let's compute that integral. All right, so the integral from 0 to x f of t dt is going to be the integral from 0 to x um, 1 over mu e negative t over mu uh, dt which is equal to we could say that this is going to be 1 over mu and then negative mu e negative t over mu and we have t ranging from 0 to uh, x. Okay, then this is going to be uh, this is going to equal uh, one over mu, and then we've got uh, mu minus mu e negative x over mu. Okay, uh, basically, I in a way I kind of switched. Uh, like the positions of these two things because I just 
Because the first term is going to be negative and the second term is going to be positive. So I, I switch them around a little bit. But this is what the integral ends up being. And uh, actually, those mu's cancel out with each other. So we get 1 minus e negative x over mu. Okay, so that means that the CDF will be 0 if uh, x is less than 0 and 1 minus e negative x over mu if x is greater than or equal to 0. All right, and now uh, we, could pot, we could plot this. All right, here's 1, here's 0. Uh, we'll actually plot a little bit to the left of, z of x equals 0. All right, so uh, plotting this thing. Uh, to the left of 0, the function is going to be 0. It is continuous at 0 because like we could plug in 0 for x, and this, would, and this term would be 1 minus 1, uh, which is 0. All right, and what is it doing as we make x very large? Well, this term is going to zero as x gets large, but it never is zero. And it's a decreasing function, or at least this red part right here is decreasing, which means that overall, one minus a decreasing part is an increasing part, therefore is, is an increasing thing. So we end up having a function that is asymptoting towards one, but never actually reaching one. So, and that's what you should have when you have a CDF. All those properties that I mentioned about CDFs before still hold for continuous random variables because you still should have that CDFs approach zero as X gets really small. And by really small, I'm including going to negative infinity. I'm not just talking about the magnitude. Um, and, uh, and uh, approaching 1 as x gets really large, you still have these functions being uh, non-decreasing, and you still have them being right continuous with left-hand limits. Those were three properties that a function had to have to be a CDF, and all those all of those properties still hold. In fact, that third property, right continuous with left-hand limits, becomes continuous everywhere because, they're, uh, be because uh, these are continuous random variables. Okay, and furthermore, this is actually another justification for why exponential random variables strongly resemble um, uh, uh, geometric random variables because geometric random variables also have this exponential decay that is being seen here. Because this function is not only uh, uh, approaching one, or let, let's say one minus the CDF is not only decaying, it's decaying exponentially quickly which is something that mathematicians care a great deal about. Okay, so here's some R code for creating, uh, for uh, plotting CDFs. This code is, like, now we don't have stra strange jumps in our CDFs. So the function, again, that we are calling is this curve function, and the function that we're putting in are these P classes of functions because those correspond to CDFs. Here I plotted the CDF of a uniform distribution. It's a standard uniform distribution over the range negative one to two. And I have a standard exponential where the rate parameter or the mean parameter is one, applying this for negative one to five. Okay, uh, next up, answer the questions posed in example three and example four, but using the CDF of the respective random variables. So we're gonna have to be uh, reminded that uh, uh, of what those questions actually were. Okay, so we're starting out uh, in that, the, the, so the first question that we're going to be reconsidering is the question where we had accidents along a stretch of road between the 100 and 150 mile posts, and uh, we were saying that the location of an accident uh, followed a uniform distribution uh, so this is this is stuff for example three. So it follows a uniform distribution with minimum parameter 100 and maximum parameter 150. Okay, so part one was to compute the probability that 110 is less than or equal to u, which is less than or equal to 130. 
and we can use CDFs to compute this probability. We can say that this is the CDF for you at 130 minus the CDF of you at uh, 110. So now we need the CDF of you. And I'm not going to really worry about the parts where it's 0 or 1 because we can pretty much guess what that is. Uh, we're going to instead worry about uh, what the CDF is over the region where it's uh, ch actually potentially changing. So FU whoa, uh, of, uh, of little u is equal to uh, little u minus 100 over 150 minus 100, which is 50. Uh, and this is equal to uh, no 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 not it, this is this is what it is but uh, we can say that this is the case if uh, u is in the set 100 oops uh, 100 to 150 so 100 to 150 so this is the set over which this is the this is the CDF in which case we get 130 minus 100 oops over 50 minus 110 minus 100 over 50 combine those fractions and you get 130 minus 110 over 50 which is going to be 20 over 50 which is two fifths so that's part one uh, part two was compute the probability that uh, 127 uh, is less than or equal to u, which is less than or equal to 144. Again, this is going to be uh, 144. Uh, so the, the CDF at 144 minus the CDF at 127, which is 144 minus 100 over 50 minus 127 excuse me 127 minus 100 over 50 which is equal to uh, 144 minus 127 over 50 which is 17 over 50 and we could just leave this 17 over 50. All right, uh, uh, part three. In part three, we ask for the probability that u is greater than 148. This is equal to one minus the probability that u is less than or equal to 148. And the, the latter probability is going to be the CDF at 148. So this is equal to one minus the CDF at 148, which is equal to, uh, so one minus uh, 148 minus 100, 148 minus 100 over 50, which is equal to, I'm going to just erase this, uh, that's going to be 48 over 50, which is equal to uh, 2 over 50, which is one, tw 1 over 25. All right, so that was for all the stuff from example 3. Now let's work with uh, example 4. So example 4. Uh, we first needed to compute the probability. We have the random variable t and t follows an exponential distribution uh, with mean parameter 20. Uh, no, uh, 10, sorry. So uh, this is going to be the probability that t is less than 20. That's going to be the CDF of t at 20. Uh, the CDF of t is going to, uh, at some input t, is going to be uh, 1 minus e uh, negative t divided by t by 10 
if t if little t is greater than or equal to zero. So this is going to be one minus e uh, negative twenty over ten, which is negative two. Uh, so negative two. All right, and we we can just leave it like that because you really can't uh, simplify that any further. Okay, next part. Uh, I want the probability uh, that 6 is less than t, which is less than 9, which is going to be the CDF at 9 minus the CDF at 6, which is, uh, that's going to be 1 minus e negative uh, 9 over 10 minus uh, 1 minus e negative 6 over 10, which is going to be e negative 0.6 minus e negative 0.9. Okay, and then for th uh, part three, we wanted to compute the probability that uh, t is greater than or equal to 22. This is going to be 1 minus the probability that t is less than 22. And we can use the CDF for that latter probability. So this is going to be 1 minus 1 minus e uh, negative 2.2, which is e negative 2.2. By the way, I never drew any pictures for any of these, but... Uh, I did draw pictures for the probabilities that we were computing in that latter section. And I still recommend when computing probabilities like this to be sketching pictures. Uh, it's be, I mean, for now, there really isn't that much of an issue. And maybe it will never be an issue for how I'm teaching this current class because you have access to R, you're not going to be using tables. But it's still worthwhile to be thinking about the areas that you are computing when you're computing probabilities. Uh, because remember, you are computing areas. You're computing integrals. All right. Uh, so uh, here are uh, all sorts of uh, uh, stuff for computing probabilities. And you may notice uh, before we were directly integrating uh, the density functions of these of these random variables using the integrate function. But we also have access to their CDF functions. So we can use those CDF functions to uh, compute probabilities. So for example, here's the CDF for that random variable u. So all this stuff is concerning u. All this stuff is concerning t. Uh, here's the CDF of u at 130 minus the CDF at 110. It gets you 0 0.4. The CDF at 144 minus the CDF at 127, that's 0.34. And 1 minus the CDF at 148, that's 0 0.04. And of course, Unlike the integrate function that's doing numerical routines and as a result often can, well, you still always have to deal with some uh, some error. I am sure, uh, very, very sure that any numerical error from using these functions, uh, these uh, CDF functions is much, much smaller than using that integrate function. So given the choice between the two, you should just about always do, be using these functions instead. So uh, another thing that we've got is that we have the CDF of the exponential. We we compute it uh, when the uh, we compute the CDF at twenty because that was basically what the first problem required. Uh, so uh, remember again that we are plugging in the rate parameter for exponentials. The rate parameter is equal to one divided by the mean parameter, which was, well, the mean parameter was 10. So this is one over 10. And so you plug in one over 10. Uh, here is the uh, second part, uh, the CDF at nine minus the CDF at six. And here's the third part, uh, one minus the CDF at 22. Okay, uh, next up are percentiles. We did have something resembling percentiles uh, in uh, the, uh, discrete case but it's just it's just more complicated i didn't bother to mention it so but in the in the continuous case percentiles are not so bad or i really don't know myself what the difference between percentile and quantile is i really should go look that up uh so 
So percentiles of a distribution is the number eta p such that f of eta p is equal to p. If you are good at math, you should recognize, oh, that looks a whole lot like saying that eta p is equal to the inverse function of p because that's a property that inverses have. Here's the thing though. We only require this for p in the interval zero uh, in the interval zero to one excluding the endpoints. And also this is only going to be the case for continuous random variables. This is not necessarily the case for discrete random variables. Here's kind of the wrinkle with thinking of the percentile function as being the inverse. Let's have a look at say the uh, CDF for a uniform random variable, which seems like a fairly simple uh, random variable. The CDF will look some, no, uh, let's not use that dark blue. That's hard to see. No, we'll use a light blue. The CDF looks something like this. So this should be a straight line that I drew. All the lines should be straight. Okay, is this thing invertible? The answer is no, it is not invertible because it doesn't pass this uh, straight line test where, all right, in order to be invertible, if I draw a vertical line, then no, a horizontal line, then it should only cross once. And oops, this function fails that test because if I draw a vertical line right here, it doesn't cross just once, it crosses an infinite number of times. So it fails that vertical line test and therefore is not invertible. And the reason why is because of these regions. But if we decided to restrict our attention to the interval or the y-axis interval uh, that can that excludes 0 and 1, on this region, it is invertible. Because the straight line ta pe uh, test is passed everywhere. You can actually define... And a quantile function in general for pretty much any random variable, it is possible to define such a function. The thing though is it won't be an inverse function, it'll be a generalized version of the inverse function. Something that works with pretty much any function that you could give it, or at least the functions that we would encounter uh, in, in probability when discussing CDFs. So that function also becomes the inverse function if the function that you're uh, applying it to is invertible. So hence the term generalized inverse because it includes inverses and other things. I'm not really going to talk about such a function here. Uh, you could take uh, math, uh, you could take a probability class to encounter such a, such a generalized in inverse function, but I'm not gonna worry about that because we're gonna say that on the interval zero to one, excluding the endpoints, the CDF for continuous random variables is invertible. So we can work with this uh, kind of inverse-like thing for that region. So if F can be inverted over its support, the support is the region over which it's uh, increasing. Uh, so the so the so the support for this function would be right here at least so that's the that's what support would mean if you we were talking about cdfs this is the region over which it's increasing so um if if it's invertible over its support we can use the inverse to find percentiles so a particularly interesting percentile is the 50th percentile otherwise known as the median which we're denoting with mu tilde all right so that was a whole bunch of uh, theoretical stuff let's see some examples of finding percentile functions uh, basically if you have if you have um if you're let's say your inverse no let's say your cdf takes this form we have f of x equals uh, zero for uh x less than some point a one for uh, x greater than some point uh, well okay we'll say greater than or equal to for these and then we'll call it um, g of x okay for um, 
a less than or equal to x, which is no a less than uh, a less than x less than b. And just to be rather general, I'm going to say that you could have possibly not you could have one or neither of the of the of the two flat regions zero and one. You can have one or neither of those or both, whatever you want. Uh, if you want, another way you could think of it is one of these put one or both of these could be infinite, right? You could you're allowed you're allowed that. This would pretty much cover uh, all the continuous random variables that we that we would encounter in this class, and pretty much all conventional continuous random variables. And G will say that G is invertible. So this is inver so G inverse of X exists. Then our percentile function, oops, that that's I don't know what that was. So our percentile function a to p for p in the region zero to one. This will be a g inverse of p. Okay. Also, just for what it's worth, if you're interested for p equals 0 or uh, p equals 1, you could still come up with what the percentile function is for those. What you would do is just look at what its minimum and maximum value, what the random variable's minimum and maximum value would possibly be. So, for example, in the case of, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the case of a uniform random variable, you would say that the percentile function for zero would be a, which is the smallest value a uniform var random variable could take, and its percentile function at one would be um, would be a, a, a b, which is the maximum value it could possibly take. In the case of an exponential, you would say its percentile function at zero would be zero because that's the minimum of an exponential random variable. And the percentile function at one would be infinity since uh, exponential random variables are unbounded. So that's another way you could, I would, long story short, you could do some, um, as, you could do some, uh, you, you could treat zero and one as special cases for your percentile function. All right, so uh, we've got kind of this definition. In this case, Um, in the case of a uniform random variable, we do in fact have a function of this form. Uh, we do have a function of this form for the CDF where G is going to be replaced with X minus A over B minus A. Okay. So in that case, we can say that well, we need to basically invert x minus a over b minus a. So we will say that um, p is equal to a to p minus a over b minus a. And we're going to solve for a to p because what we're doing is inverting a function. You remember how to invert functions from uh, intermediate or college algebra, right? So uh, multiply both sides by b minus a and we'll say that p times b minus a is equal to uh, a to of p minus a. Okay, add a to both sides. Then we'll have a to p, uh, p is equal to p times b minus a plus a. And that's it for uh, p in the interval 0 to 1. If we want, we can define eta of zero to be a, which is the minimum value a uniform random variable could take, and eta of one equal to b, which is the maximum value a uniform random variable could take. And in fact, this is what R does. R will define uh, the function at those points. And how do I get those? That's basically just by inspection. I just know how these random variables behave. I know that they're bounded between a and b. And you do too, because what you could do is just look at the PDF and look at how the PDF is behaving. The parts where the PDF are above zero rec or represent 
values this random variable could possibly take. So you just look at where this, so where does, uh, so this is the case for the uniform. Uh, oh, there's not enough room to do the exponential. This is annoying. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, I've had a few versions of these notes and some of them have more room than others. So unfortunately though, this is one uh, example where, well, this is just one situation where the typesetting didn't work out quite the way I wanted it to. Uh, and I, and I was just not paying that much attention when I turned it into a book. Anyway, um, let's maybe go on to the next page to work, uh, with the exponential. So we'll work with an exponential here. All right. Uh, so in this situation, the CDF is going to equal zero if x is less than zero, uh, less than or equal to zero, uh, and one minus e negative x over mu if x is greater than zero. All right, and uh, so this is the part, this part that I've highlighted in blue, is the part that we can invert. So we'll say p, no, not black, not, not blue, uh, I want black. So p is equal to uh, 1 minus e negative eta p divided by mu. Okay, uh, we'll subtract 1 from both sides and say that p minus 1, which by the way is a negative number since p is between 0 and 1, excluding the endpoints. This will be negative e uh, negative eta p over mu. All right, take, uh, uh, actually let's uh, mul multiply both sides by negative 1. So this will be one minus P is equal to E negative A to P over mu. All right, good. And now what is the inverse of exponentiation? Logarithms. So we take the log of both sides. So this will be LN of one minus P is equal to negative A to P over mu. All right, multiply both sides by negative mu, and you'll get a to p is equal to uh, negative mu ln 1 minus p. And by the way, ln of 1 minus p is ln of a number that's less than 1. So ln of 1 minus p is a number that's less than 0. So you're going to have a negative times a negative, which is going to be a positive. Therefore, the quantile function is going to be positive. And we could just say just basically by definition, eta of zero is equal to zero, which is representing the minimum number this random variable could take. And eta of one is equal to infinity since this random variable is unbounded. Uh, all right, so which can be observed by examining its, oh, I have bled into uh, an area where I was supposed to do more work. So hopefully you copied this down. Um, <laughs> because I'm about to erase a whole bunch of stuff. Um, this is going to be, if, if we look at the PDF of an exponential random variable, uh, it cuts off at zero, and also it has no upper bound. It's just increasing forever, so its upper bound is infinity. All right, uh, so we are now going to erase all of this, 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 because I need to reclaim some space. I need to reclaim a lot of space. It's a good thing though that this is a video where you can rewatch and things will be fine. Yeah, I know. I sing. I, that's that's something that I do. That is something that I do and I have zero regrets. Oops. There are some things about yourself that you just have to accept. And one of those is that I will do stuff like da 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 da. <laughs> All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, also, because I'm a neurotic person, I'm going to check that we are, in fact, recording and we are. Okay, uh, so I can at least, at the very least, sum up that entire conversation. So let's say that 
uh, x follows a uniform distribution with minimum parameter a and maximum parameter b, then that implies that uh, our percentile function will be uh, a if p equals 0. And by the way, this thing is undefined for p less than 0 or greater than 1 because then you're talking about non-probabilities. Uh, b if p equals 1 and uh, p times b minus a plus a if uh, if um, p is in the interval 0 to 1. All right, and uh, let's see. Uh, next one. Well, actually, first, I did ask to find the median. Okay, so what's the median for the uniform going to be? Well, we're going to use that middle part, so it's going to be uh, I can write 0 0.5 as 1 half. That's the same thing, right? I can change this to 1 half. And say this is B minus A over 2 plus A, which is also 2A over 2. And that means that this will turn into a plus, and then you get rid of that when you combine those fractions. So this is A plus B over 2, which is, by the way, is the midpoint of the interval A to B. So the median is the midpoint of that interval. That makes perfect sense. Because if it's the midpoint, then half of the area underneath the curve is to the left and half of the area is to the right, which is what the median is. Okay. Uh, next up is the exponential. The conclusion of that discussion uh, was that the percentile function is equal to, uh, we'll say 0 if p equals 0, uh, infinity if p equals 1, and uh, um, we had negative mu ln uh, 1 minus p if p is in the interval 0 to 1, which excludes the endpoints. Okay. So then, what is the median in general of an exponential random variable? Uh, let's replace p with 1 half. So that's going to be... Um, so that's going to be negative mu ln 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 half which is equal to mu ln of 2. All right. So uh, some examples of uh, percentiles. Uh, here is the median of a standard uniform where the lower bound is 0 and the upper bound is 1. What's in between 0 and 1 exactly in the middle at 1 half is 1 half. All right. Shocker. Uh, this is a little bit more uh, interesting. So that's actually evaluating to ln of 2. All right. So all of that was about uh, CDFs, and I hope that you noticed that everything that we talked about with regards to CDFs was what we is uh, what we saw before when working with discrete random variables. It's just we've replaced sums with integrals. Now, for expected values, with expected values, we were um, working with sums. Now we're working in the continuous case, and what happens? You replace sums with integrals. That's all that, that That's all that changes. So that means that the expected value for a continuous random variable x is going to be the integral from negative infinity to infinity x f of x dx uh, for some function h of x. You have the integral negative infinity to infinity, uh, h of little x, f of little x, dx. And the variance of x is going to be the integral from negative infinity to infinity, uh, little x minus mu squared, uh, f of x, 
dx. As a reminder, uh, the expected value of x is often referred to as mu. Okay. Um, and additionally, we had a shortcut formula in the discrete case, and we have the exact same shortcut formula in the continuous case. The shortcut formula is exactly the same. The proof for the shortcut formula is pretty much exactly the same. In fact, I hope at some point you've been wondering, this is kind of annoying that we have slightly different formulas for discrete and continuous cases. If you were to take graduate level probability classes, you would say, actually, there really isn't any difference between discrete and uniform. And there is one generalized notion of expected value and CDF. Well, the CDF is always a probability that X is less than or equal to X, little x that is. So you already have that as a generalized um, notion. The, uh, the probability mass function and probability density functions are particular instances of what's known as a radon negative der derivative. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, we're going to leave that right there for now. <laughs> and, uh, um, it, and also, if you're working in general in probability in this uh, graduate level probability class, uh, you don't you you have this generalized notion of integral, which corresponds to the Lebesgue integral, and you would use Lebesgue integrals to define your expected values. In which case, you don't have to have separate formulas for discrete and continuous. You have just one formula for that. Not just covers discrete and continuous, but co but covers pretty much every random variable, discrete, continuous, mixture. Cauchy set valued, <laughs> whatever. Um, all right. Um, all right. Next up, example nine. Compute the expected value of x and the variance of x for the uniform and exponential random variables. All right. So the uniform cases, it shouldn't be too hard. The exponential case, though, will call upon you as a student to remember how to do integration by parts from calculus two. All right, so carrying on. The expected value of x in the, in the uniform case. So x is following a uniform distribution with minimum parameter a and maximum parameter b. All right, the expected value of x is the integral. Uh, you know what? Let's get really technical here. Uh, we will go from negative infinity to infinity as the formula above here uh, requires. And we will write x f of x uh, dx. All right. And then we will split up into cases. We have negative infinity to a uh, x f of x. Uh, darn it. Oh, cheap laptop screen. How I hate you. All right. x f of x dx plus... Um, uh, we won't write this, these necessarily in order. We'll go from B to infinity. Uh, X, F of X, DX. And then as the final one, the actual interval over which we care, X, F of X, DX. All right. So on the interval negative infinity to A, uh, F of X, the, the probability density function is equal to zero. So you have something times zero, which means that the whole thing is equal to zero, which means that this part actually doesn't matter. And for b to infinity, again, this is equal to zero. You have something times zero, so you get zero, and thus this part doesn't matter either. All right? So that leaves the interval a to b, on which we would replace f of x with what it is on this interval, which is uh, 1 over b minus a. All right. And 1 over b minus a is a constant, so we could say, all right, we got 1 over b minus a. And then we have the integral from a to b, uh, x dx. And hopefully you remember what that integral is. Uh, the antiderivative of x is x squared over 2. So this will be 1 over b minus a. And then we have x squared over 2 over going ranging from a to b, which is equal to 1 over b minus a times, uh, well, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring out that one half as a factor and say this is one over two B minus a, uh, effectively canceling that out. 
uh, inside of that parenthesis thing. And then we're going to have b squared minus a squared. And maybe you notice, oh, that's a difference of squares. So b squared minus a squared actually factors out. It's going to factor into b minus a times b plus a. All right. Oh, look at that. We got cancellation of b minus a's. So we're left with, in the end, that this is equal to a plus b over 2. And that's the expected value of a uniform. And in fact, this is also the median of a uniform random variable. Huh. Well, look at that. The median is the same as the mean. Hmm. Curious. Actually, that's a property that, assuming that a random variable has a mean, which, once again, I'm going to repeat, not all random variables have means. Not all random variables have expected values. If it does have a mean, and that random variable's uh, CD, uh, PDF is symmetric, then the mean and the median will be the same. Shocker. Okay. Uh, next up, what the heck is this? Is this thing doing? I don't know what that button does. It makes me worried. Oh, good. We've got plenty of room on the next page. All right. Um, that's because we also need to compute the variance. Uh, you know what? How about we go ahead and compute the variance of a uniform random variable? Which means if we're going to use that shortcut formula, we need to compute the expected value of x squared. The expected value of x squared is going to be, all right, this time I'm gonna to cut to the chase and say this is gonna be the integral from a to b of x squared over b minus a dx. I apologize that there is a vehicle driving around outside my apartment and making noise. It's too bad. But, or is that outside? Oh, that's my upstairs neighbors. No. Who is... Okay, it is outside. It is outside. They're working on the grounds, and it's really annoying. All right, continue on. Uh, all right, so this is going to be 1 over b minus a. And we have the antiderivative of x squared is going to be x cubed over 3. And this is going from a to b. And, all right, so this is going to be... I'm going to bring out that 3. So this will be 1 over 3 times b minus a. And then we get uh, uh, b cubed minus a cubed. All right, you might not remember this one. But this is a difference of cubes, and there is a formula for that. So, the difference of cubes can be factored to be b minus a times a squared plus a b plus b squared. That's a formula. Go look it up. Um, so those cancel out and we're left with uh, a squared plus a b plus b squared over 3. All right. Now I want to compute the variance. The variance is going to be the expected value of x squared minus the mean of x squared. All right. Which is equal to a squared plus ab plus b squared over 3 minus um, a plus b over 2 squared and I'm going to go ahead and just uh, apply that square right now and say that this is going to be a squared plus 2ab plus b squared over 4. And I want to combine these two fractions. The common denominator of them would be 12. So this will be 4a squared plus 4ab plus 4 b squared because I need to multiply the left hand fraction by 4 in order to get to the, the common denominator of 12 and then we're going to have minus we need to multiply the other fraction by 3 so we'll have 3a squared uh, minus 6ab uh, min uh, no right, we'll put this like this okay there we go plus 3b squared over 12 alright 
And then we combine these two fractions. Uh, so how is it exactly going to combine? We're going to end up with, uh, so we got four a squareds and then we take away three of those. So we're left with a single a squared left and similarly for b squared. And in this, and in this case, the fours are more dominant than the threes. And so we'll end up with like plus b squared and positive a squared. All right. And then we have four a b minus six, uh, minus six a b. So this will be minus two a b. All of this divided by 12. And in fact, we can say, oh, well, this is a this is a, a perfect square. A minus B squared over 12. Which, considering that A is less than B, is not as enlightening as... Uh, th that formula is not as enlightening as saying B minus A over 12. And we're allowed to do that because we're squaring. So, in the end, you get the length of the interval over which this random variable could possibly be. Uh, divide, uh, take that length, square it, and then divide by 12. Why 12? Why not 12? Well, basically, the reason why 12 is because that's the number that showed up in all these calculations. So there's nothing really uh, interesting to read about the number 12. All right. Uh, I'm probably going to need to reclaim some more space in order to continue my calculations on... Uh, for the exponential random variable. So I'm going to do a lot of erasing and just summarize uh, this discussion. So erase, erase, erase. Erase, erase, erase. I It's so nice to be recording videos because I now have the liberty to do stuff like this because I know that you can just rewind and look at what I last wrote down so that you can catch up if you need to. All right, so, um, and we'll even go ahead and do some erasing up here. So, all right. Boy, this is taking a while. Anybody know any good jokes? Post them in the comments. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, we'll leave that notation and say, that in the end, by the way, Wikipedia is actually a good place to go look up information about random variables. They have a lot of basic statistics about common ran random variables, like their CDFs, their PDFs, their um, expected values, their percentiles, their quantiles, their medians, their variances, stuff like that. So Wikipedia is a, often a good place to look. Um, and along with some other basic facts about certain random variables that I haven't actually mentioned. In fact, I may post uh a reference sheet for uh common random variables a lot of some basic facts about them that i created for uh an introductory probability class it's a good place to look um because a lot of this stuff can be summarized it's like okay the expected value of a uniform is a plus b over two this is always the formula so all you need to do is specify the parameters of that particular uh random variable and you're good and its variance is always of the form uh, B minus A squared over 12. So just plug in the parameters and you can get its variance. Recognizing a random variable and being able to associate formulas with it is a very valuable skill. So uh, next up, uh, we are talking about exponential random variables uh, with uh, parameter mu. You should probably guess what mu is going to end up being or what the expected value is going to be because that notation is highly suggestive. All right, so the expected value of this random variable x is going to be the integral from zero to infinity x e negative, no, 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 hold on, uh, x over mu e negative x over mu uh, dx. Okay. I see x over mu in a couple places, and honestly, I am just sick of having to deal with x over mu. So, uh, I'm going to say that u is equal to x over mu. What I'm about to do is a change of variables. Uh, remember that when you were talking about integral calculus. Uh, so, that means that du is equal to 1 over mu uh, dx, uh, which suggests notice that um 
what we could possibly do is try to group a one over mu with the dx, but unfortunately that x over mu is already accounted for by a u. So we don't want to do that. Uh, what we could do instead uh, when doing this change of variables is say uh, that uh, mu du is equal to dx. All right, so which which means that this uh, integral is going to become mu integral uh, du. Oh yeah, we do also need to think about the boundaries, but the thing though is the lower bound a is going to be zero over mu, which is equal to uh, zero. And the upper bound b is going to be infinity over mu, which is still infinity. And I'm treating infinity like a number. I know it's not a number, but I really don't care at this point. <laughs> um, I'm so used to doing I'm so used to doing this, and honestly, it's like we know what we mean. We know that we're actually talking about limits. And if you if you study it a little bit more rigorously like that as limits, you end up with the same thing. So we're fine. So we have mu integral from zero to infinity u e negative u du all right that's 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 nicer to work with uh at least it means that we don't have to do as much writing the only thing though is we don't know an antiderivative off the top of our head i mean i guess if you've already worked on this a thousand times then you already know what the antiderivative is but um if you're working with only those elementary functions you don't necessarily automatically have an antiderivative for u e negative u until you start integrating by parts. So to integrate by parts, recall the formula, because I do think that some people would probably uh, forget this. This is one thing about this class. This is when all of your calculus gets called back into question and students suddenly start to discover their calculus wasn't actually that good. <laughs> um, all right, so remember the integration by parts formula. Uh, F, FDG uh, is equal to uh, FG minus integral uh, gdf although in this case we are integrating over some range so we'll put a to b in which case this part becomes evaluating from a to b and we have an integral right here all right so then the question comes of identifying the f and the g that we're going to use in our integration by parts some of this comes from experience other parts is just like recognizing what your future steps are going to be as you're going through the integration by parts procedure so in general, I have a polynomial multiplied with an exponential and uh, I would, so, all right, here's how I like to think of integration by parts. I, I pick an F and I pick a DG. All right, so F is something that's already in our integral. So I could either pick U or E to the power of negative U for F. And whatever I don't pick will become a part of DG. All right. And those are things that are already in the formula, in a sense. So what we don't have is G and DF. So we kind of fill out this table. That's how I like to think of it. I think of it as filling out a table. So U is in the integral. So I'm going to say F is equal to U. And DG is E negative U DU. And the idea is how I go from F to DF is by differentiation. And if I differentiate U, it will go down a power. And going down a power is a good thing. Because if I'm going down a power, I'm kind of reducing the complexity of the case or something like that. Um, I'm going from something I don't know to something I do know when I'm choosing the polynomial to be the F. So in this case, DF, when I differentiate U, I'm just going to get 1. And I'm going to end up with a du here. One times du, just, just to be clear of what, what that is. All right, now for the dg. dg is e negative u du. So to go to the g, we need an antiderivative for e negative u. And the antiderivative will be negative e negative u. If we had chosen instead for f to be e to the negative u, we would have gone to df equals negative e negative u. If we had chosen... And if we chose an F to be the E negative U, we would have been forced to go with U du as dg, which then when we go to the antiderivative would get us to U squared over 2, which would make our problem even harder because we don't know how to work with U squared over 2.
So I chose the polynomial U because that in some sense brings me into a situation that I know, which is how to take the antiderivative of E negative U. Because in the end, uh, these parts that I underline in red are going to show up in the final integral. All right. So uh, this part then, according to the integration by parts formula, is going to be mu. And then we've got uh, negative u e negative u, that's fg, uh, going from 0 to infinity. And then we have minus negative 0 to infinity uh, e negative u du. That's all the red part. Okay, now, of course, I just wrote minus minus, so I'm going to turn that into a plus. Okay, and then the question is, how do I handle the rest of this? Um, all right, so how am I going to handle, say, this green part? Well, if I were to plug in the endpoint zero, I would get zero times one, which is zero. All right, so how about the infinity? Well, that's a more complicated case. And I'm going to leave it to you to use L'Hopital's rule and determine... Re remember that what actually we're doing here is we're putting a b here and taking the limit of b... Uh, uh, the limit as uh, b approaches infinity. So uh, for the infinity portion, uh, what we would actually do is compute the limit as b approaches infinity of um, neg uh, negative b e negative b. Because what instead of infinity up here, we should have a b and be taking a limit. And you can use L'Hopital's rule to determine that that limit is in fact equal to zero. I am just so used at myself to thinking of uh, rates of increase to know that e to the power, <coughs> excuse me, e to the power negative u goes to zero faster than u goes to infinity. And since that's the case, since e to the u, negative u goes to zero faster than u goes to infinity, that means that the entire term is going to go to zero. So if I were to plug in infinity, in a sense, because you can't actually plug in infinity, but if I could, it would evaluate to zero. As a result, uh, this green part, uh, this green part goes to zero. So in the end, what we are left with for our integral is that this is equal to uh, mu, and then the integral from 0 to infinity, e negative u du. And then we need to compute this integral. Um, and I'm going to leave it to you to show that this is equal to 1. But it does. It, it's equal to 1. Actually, you could just argue, okay, we have... Um, I could just say, for instance that secretly hidden we have 1 over 1 e negative uh oh that that looks like a mu that should not be a mu uh we have e negative 1 over 1 e to the power negative u over 1 which by the way is the integral from 0 to infinity of the pdf of this random variable or of, of a random variable an exponential random variable with parameter 1 and those integrals always evaluate to 1 so since whenever you integrate a PDF, it always integrates to one. So hence, without actually going through the calculus of this term, I know that it's going to be one. Uh, so that means that we're going to end up with mu. So the expected value of x equals our mean parameter mu. Hence, we get the interpretation for what mu is. Okay, that was quite a bit. Uh, that was uh, quite a bit. So you may want to look over that again. That trick, by the way, of recognizing when you're integrating over a PDF, that's a very handy trick.
if you can recognize something as a PDF, um, that, some, that some integral is a PDF, uh, or integrating a PDF, and that, that means that it automatically becomes one. And sometimes you might do like algebraic manipulations to make it so that you do end up, or, where initially you weren't integrating by a PDF, but you could make it so that you are. So for example, um, let's say I wanted to compute, let's say I wanted to compute an integral, um, let's say zero to infinity e negative x over mu dx. Let's say I wanted to compute this integral and there's nothing else. I could then say, okay, we got mu divided by mu here. So this is equal to mu times uh, the integral from zero to infinity, one over mu e negative x over mu uh, dx. We could do that. And then we say, well, actually, uh, this part on the inside is the integral of a PDF. It's the integral of a PDF, of an exponential PDF, where the uh, um, where the uh, uh, parameter of that exponential is uh, mu. So that's always going to equal one because integrals of PDFs are always equal to one. So it's a useful trick, something to keep in mind when you are going on with your life and uh, your mathematics education and you encounter strange looking integrals, but you are able to take advantage, further advantage of your probability training to quickly compute those integrals because you recognize the random variables that they, uh, that they can be associated with. All right, uh, so that was just the expected value of x, but we still need, we still need the variance of x, and uh, which means that we need to compute the expected value of x squared and then the variance. So let's compute the expected value of x squared. Okay, so the expected value of x squared is going to be the integral from zero to infinity of one over mu uh, x squared uh, e negative x over mu dx. Okay, so I'm already annoyed by the one over mu stuff. So we're gonna do that change of formula, uh, change of variables again, except we're probably going to need to put a mu out here and a mu squared in the bottom. So basically that's multiplying and dividing by mu. We're going to do that because we need to have in the end, if I do that, I can rewrite uh, this uh, multiplicative term inside of the integral as x over mu squared. All right. And then I can say that u is equal to x over mu, which means that du is equal to uh, uh, dx over mu, which means that mu du is equal to dx. All right, which then means that, oh yeah, the boundaries of the integral stay the same. So uh, this will be mu squared, and then we have the integral from zero to infinity, u squared e negative u du. All right, uh, removing all this stuff. All right, once again, we find ourselves in a situation where we're probably gonna to need to do some integration by parts because we don't know how to integrate u squared e negative u du. Or, or at least, well, we do, but we don't have one of those elementary formulas for it unless you were to go to an integral table, which we will not do because we are not cheaters. Okay, it's not cheating to use an integral table, but still. Um, uh, all right, so using once again this principle that you should be picking f and g uh, to make your life simpler because we're going to fill out this table. So F equals G equals DF equals DG equals. And you pick an F, you pick the F and DG and you should pick the F to, in some sense, make the problem simpler. So we'll say F is equal to U squared because then when we differentiate, we're going to end up with two U, which is making our problem simpler. DG will be E negative U, DU. All right, so then we go to df, that's going to be 2u du. G will be negative e, negative u once again. All right, 
So that means that this integral will equal mu squared times, uh, let's see, we've got uh, u, negative u squared e negative u going from zero to infinity. And then we've got plus once again because of the minus here. Uh, go away. Uh, uh, so plus uh, 2 because of the 2 here, uh, 0 to infinity, uh, u, e, uh, negative u, du. Okay. This green part, once again, will go to 0. See the previous arguments in the case when we were computing the expected value of x. It's the same reasoning e to the negative u goes to zero faster than u squared goes to infinity because one decays exponentially fast while the other grows polynomially fast and exponential beats polynomial but i do invite you to go through the exercise of using l'hopital's rule to actually determine that this is the case by replacing infinity with b and then taking the limit as b approaches infinity all right and also if you were to plug in zero we'd have zero times one once again so that goes to zero for the same reason so that term right there in green goes to zero for the same reason that this term before that we wrote that was also in green goes to zero. It's essentially the same reason. Uh, okay, so that leaves us. Uh, that leaves us with mu squared, no, two mu squared, uh, and then the integral from zero to infinity uh, u e negative u du because there was a factor of two right here. And I already know what that is because we've already done this. We've already computed that integral. This term that I have written down, uh, this integral is the expected value of a random variable t where t follows an exponential distribution with parameter 1. So we already know how to we already know what that is. That's equal to one. So that means that this blue term is equal to one. So we get in the end two mu squared. Again, being able to recognize integrals as other integrals, really valuable because it will save you a lot of time. We would hate to have to recompute that thing. Alright, so in the end, uh, as of just a reminder, this whole calculation was the expected value of x squared. Okay, so then we compute the variance. The variance of x is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the mean of x squared, which is equal to 2 mu squared minus mu squared, which is equal to mu squared. Oh, how lovely. So that means that the expected value of an exponential random variable is mu. Its variance is mu squared, so its standard deviation is also mu. So the expected value, or the mean of an exponential is equal to the, st the standard deviation of the same exponential. It's kind of funny. I often get that confused with the Poisson random variable, where in the case of the Poisson, the mean of a Poisson is mu, and the variance of a Poisson is mu. So the variance rather than the standard deviation. I'm often getting that confused, and it's unfortunate, but, well, that's life. Uh, all right, so uh, before we wrap up this section, we're almost done. I'll just, I'll just quickly mention some R code. In this case, I compute the mean of a, of a uniform random variable uh, where it's, a, where it's a minimum and maximum are 0 and 1. In this case, the function that I'm integrating is a function that depends on x. Uh, integrate allows you to kind of insert an x like that. Um, and uh, here's the thing that I'm integrating. You can recognize this as x f of x. And I'm even integrating from negative 1 to 2 so that I get the, so I kind of allow for these uh, zero regions to, to appear. Um, and in the end, we get 0 0.5, which corresponds to the median, which is what we basically got before. You use that formula we had before, and, it, and you get the same thing. This is the mean. And 
here I reference the value. So what actually gets re returned is some integrate object that re that contains not only the value of the integral, but also other information. Uh, you might call it metadata, like for example, the error of the calculation. So we need to refer to the value of that variable. Um, so what's actually returned by this um, is an R uh, list. Uh, but we can uh, get the value of the mean like so. So when we compute, so right here, we're computing the variance of the uh, uh, uniform, in which case there's actually not really any reason to use the shortcut formula because the shortcut formula is more useful for uh, hand calculations rather than uh, whatever the computer's doing. And I'm guessing that this makes sense. So I really don't have any strong opinions about that calculation. Um, as for mu2, this is the case of an exponential uh, with parameter 1. So I integrate uh, x times the density of the exponential on the interval 0 to infinity. And that gets me 1, which is what we should get considering the parameter of this thing. Uh, and then I get the variance, which is also 1. All right, so that concludes this section. Uh, in the next, and actually, I would say uh, this concludes the more general discussions up until maybe section six uh, about continuous random variables. And from this point on, I'm going to be talking about specific instances of continuous random variables. We've already seen two specific instances: uh, the uniform and the exponential. And there's a few more that I would like to discuss, such as. Well, for starters, uh, the normal distribution, which is probably the most important distribution in all of probability theory and all of statistics. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, talking about some others that will often appear in applications, such as, um, let's see, uh, we've got uh, log normal, gamma, beta, vable. I think that's it. And then the last section talks about uh, some uh, techniques for maybe deciding what type of uh, distribution a, random, a continuous random variable comes from. So uh, that's it for now. Uh, I will see you later.